Today I'm going to talk about um, the work that we have been doing for the, uh, for the past couple of months uh, regarding uh, to create the recombinant protein and antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 to help us uh, combat this global pandemic. So before we uh, get into the contents of the talk, I would like to uh, give a quick shout out about Sinobiological. So we, I think we are in the industry known as the recombinant protein company. Uh, so we, have, we are, have extensive experience uh, regarding recombinant protein and recombinant antibody expressions, as well as the antibody discoveries. And uh, uh, our uh, portfolio comes in both products from um, genes to all the way to ELISA, ELISA kits as well as CRO services, which allows us to help our client with their process from drug discovery to drug screening and also to all the way to production and to characterization. And uh, so now uh, we have that out of the way. Um, so the content of the talk is divided into uh, basically four topics. So firstly, we're going to give a quick review of the current situation. And then I'm going to talk about um, the work that we have been doing to essentially recreate the SARS-CoV-2 protein library um, in vitro. And I'm going to do quickly, and the, I'm going to also quickly introduce you to the VITMAP system, which is a high throughput antibody and protein expression system. And lastly, last but not least, of course, is summary and acknowledgement. So um, the current situation that we're in, so we're in the, uh, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which it has caused um, uh, over uh, 740,000 deaths and with like over 20 million confirmed cases all over the world. So this is a dire situation. And the culprit for this uh, pandemic is the SARS-CoV-2 virus as indicated in this uh, electron micro, um, microscope image here. But of course, um, it's an RNA virus, but there is of course more than meets the eye. So the, um, the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is comprised of a single stranded RNA and it encodes about, uh, it can be divided into 10 open reading frames and it encodes about 25 proteins. Um, the proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 can be categorized based on their function as structural proteins, which include nucleocapsid, membrane, envelope, and the spike protein, which is the uh, inter which interacts with the host ACE2 receptor and is the basically the entry point of the virus. And of course, there's non-structural proteins, which are uh, which include enzymes. Uh, the, catal uh, ca uh, the catalyze the uh, crucial biological functions to ensure the survival and propagation of the virus. And of course, there are some access a lot of accessory proteins that are involved uh, to facilitate the enzymes to carry out their biological functions. So the proteins, no matter uh, the non-structural or the structural components of the virus are important targets uh, for both diagnostic and uh, uh, therapeutic agent development purposes. Um, <clears throat> so again, so they're basically very good candidate for drug discovery. And uh, I think based on the scope of the current uh, medicine, uh, we can divide the, the, the drugs into two categories, both basically the biologics, biologics and small molecules. So biologics are the uh, basically antibody and antibody derivatives that can be uh, generated using different methods. And they basically target uh, the spike protein and they either in, uh, disrupt the spike interaction with the host ACE2 or they just flag the, the virus for the uh, immune system to, um, uh, uh, to clear the virus out of the system. And of course, there are small, uh, small molecules uh, that can be generated either by uh, compound screening or structure-based design. And I think with the development of artificial intelligence, um, this can also be a method uh, to facilitate the drug discovery process. So basically we obtain um, the structure of an enzyme uh, for the, for instance, for the SARS-CoV-2 and based on the structure, um, um, we perform, a, uh, you know, scientists perform a rational design and, uh, or they uh, perform a rational design or screening against uh, either compound libraries or, uh, uh, start from a compound template 
uh, to discover small molecules that can be used to neutralize the functionalities of these, uh, of these enzymes. Um, so as you can see in this regard, the high quality recombinant proteins, um, recombinant virus proteins are important starting materials uh, for the drug discovery process. And of course, the proteins are also important for uh, development of diagnostic tools, especially uh, for, uh, for the ser serological tests of the viruses. And now, of course, the COVID-19 can be tested using molecular tests, which is accurate, but you know, takes, a while to, uh, to, takes a while to develop and to get the results. And uh, so there's, I think there's an urgent need for uh, very, uh, for reliable serological uh, tests. Uh, I think the com combination of the two test formats can uh, really help us uh, get control of the situation. So f to develop the serological test, we, were, would, we would also require, you know, high quality uh, protein material and antibody material um, from, uh, of, of derived from the, from the SARS-CoV-2. So of course the ser serological diagnostics of the virus comes in you know, different shapes and forms. Um, they, of course they have their you know, pros and cons in terms of uh, the availability, uh, also, the time for, uh, also the time for development. And, and last but not least, of course, is the sensitivity. But you know, no matter which format of the test that we would like to develop, I think the uh, a prerequisite of uh, obtaining a high sensitivity and high specific specificity tests, serological tests for COVID nineteen, is the um, is is based on uh, the the good quality starting material, which are the uh, um, the recombinant proteins as well as um, anti as well as antibodies. So um, there are several targets on the virus that are very good for uh, you know serological test development. So the first one is its nucleocapsid protein. And interestingly, the nucleocapsid protein of the SARS-CoV-2 is actually highly uh, relatively highly conserved with that of the of, of the SARS virus, SARS-CoV virus, which was which emerged in the, in the two, early 2000, 2003, I believe. <clears throat> and uh, uh, ba uh, and uh, you know, based on the similarities, we, we can develop, a, we can uh, use the uh, SARS antibody essentially to, de to detect SARS-CoV-2 as in an in, in example shown here. Um, this antibody, which is a rabbit monoclonal antibody from our company, uh, can recognize both uh, the SARS-CoV-2 and SARS viruses, but has relatively very little um, cross reactivity against other coronavirus coronaviruses, and also the spike protein is also another very good target for um, antibody development. And because for one thing, it has a, a very uh, wide distribution of linear B cell epitopes, which enables the body to generate sufficient uh, immune response against this protein. Uh, and the antibodies derived from the spike protein can either be used as detecting antibodies uh, in serological de test development, or uh, we can obtain like neutralizing antibodies for um, therapeutics applications. And here is an example um, showing several uh, neutralizing antibodies that has been uh, discovered during the uh, process uh, from the literature during the uh, uh, past few months, which demonstrates um, the notion that the spike protein is a, a inevitably hot target uh, for, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So as I mentioned earlier, recombinant proteins are very useful, powerful tools um, for both drug discovery and the serological assay development. So that's our, uh, so that is um, the reason the why we have devoted uh, most of our, a majority of our efforts during the past few months um, to uh, develop these proteins as the recombinant protein format and to essentially reconstitute a SARS-CoV-2 protein library um, uh, using our platforms. So basically to give a quick recap of the technique of protein uh, recombinant protein expression. Uh, so basically we use a tar we have a target gene and we um, uh, we uh, introduce the gene into a host cell 
uh, with a vector and the host cell can then, uh, and then it can trigger the, you know, the whole cell uh, protein production machinery uh, to overexpress the, the, the protein of interest. So, and we can uh, obtain the proteins through purification methods. So at Sinobiological, we mainly use these three platforms for um, a recombinant protein expression. And I think during this, um, during the uh, times of the pandemic, it is uh, very, uh, the, the speed is a key. So it's very important that we um, develop the virus proteins quickly. Um, so, and then we are, ju we just have the, I think we just have the capacity to do that. Uh, I think we uh, previously would take us only a very short period of time uh, in, couple, uh, in, in, the, in the range of two weeks to develop proteins against uh, influenza and Zika viruses. And, and this time, I think we, uh, we are the first company to uh, publicly uh, uh, to, to produce this uh, recombinant SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike RBDs uh, in, just 12, uh, in just 12 days upon the publication of this sequence. And because of this um, you know, a robust platform that we have established, um, we have also um, created you know, vir uh, virus proteins from uh, different viruses. And uh, so this, this uh, so here is a uh, link to the uh, viral antigen bank we call the ProVi. Um, so this is a good collection of reagents um, for you know, virus research. We have uh, over 800 proteins available and we also have ELISA kits and uh, uh, antibodies against a, a, a over like 350 uh, string of uh, different viruses. So, um, so this is a good collection of tools and if you're interested, uh, you can find more uh, on this web, web page. So the challenges for the COVID-19 uh, antigen development or for any other uh, virus protein development is, so firstly, of course, uh, the speed is, as I mentioned earlier, speed is the key. So um, we would choose uh, systems that can um, both preserve the biological function uh, uh, functionalities of the protein and obtain the protein during a relatively shorter period of time. So in this case, the HEC-293 and E. coli uh, might be prioritized, but we can also use the insect cell as a backup plan. And uh, uh, in terms of culture methods, the stable cell line development could take uh, for the HEC-293 or uh, the CHO cell lines can take a month to establish. Uh, but the transient transfection methods will allow us the obtaining of um, a recombinant protein in a relatively fast fashion. So that's the, so this is the go-to method uh, that we use for for this in Denver as well. So and of course the quality of the protein should not be compromised. Um, the, uh, the I think the quality is re reflected in two regards. First is the uh, we should produce protein with uh, relevant biological activities. Uh, which means that so so we should you know uh, we, we should pay attention to the post translation of modifications and uh, of course if there are any uh, you know cleavage of the protein by uh, certain enzymes that and to to put them into like two subunits like the case of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike or the influenza HA virus uh, HA proteins and if there are any like mutations we need to pay attention to and uh, we can produce the protein in what kind of formats, like uh, um, basically the, the choices of uh, affinity tags are important as well and to, uh, to, eat, to make sure the tags do not interfere with the uh, biological in, uh, activity of the proteins. And of course, um, <clears throat> uh, we would also focus on, you know, which domains of a protein we would like to go uh, explore first. Um, so, uh, so the bio, so this, uh, so the biological reactivity will dictates the whole system and the design of the protein, and if any uh, engineering methods that we would apply, and also uh, to um, predetermine, you know, what kind of assay format that we would like to take. Of course, with that, we would also try to minimize batch to batch variations, which is um, actually a uh, it's actually a problem for you know these transient infections as infection methods uh, the proteins you know comes in different uh, shapes and formats and they uh, with their uh, characteristics in the structure they could potentially impose some uh, difficulties for us uh, they can prone 
they might be prone to aggregation and degradation, and there might be you know activity um, fluctuations between batch to batch. So this requires us to optimize the uh, transfection vector and the methods to introduce the gene into the cells and make the cells in a you know culture condition as stable as possible. And of course, last but not least, to, do, um, to optimize the purification methods um, to minimize the damage of the protein during the, uh, during the extraction process. And lastly, of course, is the quantity because the proteins are used you know, in dif uh, by different people at, at different scale uh, and uh, they should be shipped maybe like all over the world. So, uh, we would need, uh, so we would need to produce the protein at small scale, in this case, the, you know, the flasks, um, <clears throat> shaker flasks, or we can produce the protein at intermediate level using these um, mid-sized mid bioreactors and we can also we also have like these gigantic uh, 500 liter and 1,000 liter bioreactors uh, for transient protein expression uh, as well to meet the demand of a uh, large quantity of the proteins. So um, with that and with all the with the established expression systems, we are gradually starting to map the uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteome essentially. Um, and so, uh, so here, as, uh, as you can see, we have successfully produced uh, s several enzymes of the SARS-CoV-2, some non-structural proteins, uh, the, of and of course, the nuclear capsid and the spike protein. And the spike protein, we uh, make them into different um, sections. For instance, we have the full length, we have the S1, S2, the RBD, and we also, of course, have the, uh, you know, the RBD mutants. Uh, so the dark green colored proteins ha are, are the development of these proteins are completed and as uh, the, the little star here indicates, you know, these proteins are active in terms of um, in, in their in, in like enzymatic activity analysis. And of course, some of these proteins are still under development, but uh, we're confident they will be uh, um, um, out from the pipeline soon. And it, in the meantime, we also develop, you know, protein reagents for other coronaviruses. Um, <clears throat> so to, together with the, with the ones from the SARS-CoV-2 and I think in collaboration of Nanomule, we have developed this uh, Sinomule, Sinomule uh, chip, which um, is a, a chip for uh, detecting any format of uh, upper respiratory viral infections. Um, in, a, in a relatively high throughput format. So this is the, basically the current, so uh, this is the brief overview of the current progress. And uh, now I'm going to take us, um, a, let, a dive a little bit deeper into, um, in, into these uh, key components of the SARS-CoV-2. So first of all, of course, it's a spike. And uh, here shows the, uh, the, the S1 portion of the CoV-2 spike proteins um, that we expressed using the transient uh, HEC-293 um, expression system. So we make the protein bearing different tags, either his tag or FC tag, and the proteins show good homogeneity um, and purity. And of course, the protein is active and in its binding to the ACE2 receptor and with the optimized uh, expression methods, we can ensure the minimum batch-to-batch -batch variations, uh, both in regard of their homogeneity, um, as here shown here by three um, by the data from three lots, and their uh, uh, binding affinity towards ACE2, um, and you know the also shown here uh, the, the 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 binding affinity varies only a little bit uh, between the between the three lots here. And the spike that the S1 protein has already been used um, in in an assay to determine the serum antibody from you know SARS-CoV-2 patient, uh, which shows um, which shows a very good uh, signal to noise ratio um, when comparing to the um, to the serum from healthy donor. And I think since I think it was in February when this um, when the reports started to come in about the the mutations that has been discovered uh, in in the spike protein, and especially this um, this mutation D614G has raised a lot of eyebrows 
um, because of its dominance in the in the in you know in the virus strains and also in its um, potentially uh, increased uh, infectious uh, you know infectivity. So um, with that, we cre uh, we also generate the, the S1 portion of this you know quote unquote mutant. And this, uh, this mutant has been produced in the HEC-293 cell as well. And it also has very good purity um, and homogeneity over 95% as judged by um, the, uh, by the SCC uh, chromatography. And in terms of binding affinity towards the ACE2, uh, we tested these, um, this characteristics using both the ELISA method as well as a BRI method. And the, the results um, that we discover is that this, mute, this particular mutation did not alter uh, the binding affinity of the, the S1 of the SARS-CoV-2 to ACE2 uh, significantly, which is not surprised um, considering you know, the location of this mutation uh, is slightly further off from the, the receptor binding domain, which carries, uh, mainly carries out the uh, you know, ACE2 binding activity. Uh, but in terms of the infectious, um, you know, uh, the, the ability to infect host cells, uh, we did create it, a pseudovirus uh, based on this um, 614G mutant. And interestingly, we do ob um, ob uh, observe a significantly increased transduction fold change um, comparing to the, you know, quote unquote wild type 614D uh, D variants. And in, in, of course, in our system, and this is a, this trend actually agrees with the the published record, indicating that um, this this mutation, this D six fourteen G mutation, uh, did all, uh, did increase the infectious ability of of this virus. And of course, um, besides the mut mutant in um, the uh, at the six fourteen position. On there are various mutations been reported in, in the RBD, the receptor binding domain as well. So as I mentioned earlier, we were the first company to produce RBD using a recombinant um, protein expression method. And this was used in the structural studies uh, to review its interaction with the ACE2. And with RBD, we were also able to generate a rapid uh, monoclonal antibody that shows very good um, virus specificity against COVID-2, but not, <clears throat> does not interact with uh, the RB, uh, does not interact with RBD of other coronaviruses, which is a good uh, reagent for a serological de uh, assay development. And of course, now we've started tracking the, the mutations that are um, indicated in the, uh, in the literature uh, um, that happens um, during this, uh, to, to the RBD region. So, here are several examples of the, mut uh, of the mutant proteins that we've already produced. And we test, of course, we tested their binding affinity with the ACE2 using an ELISA type of form, uh, ELISA type of assay. And there are, you know, uh, ups and downs regarding to their binding affinity. Um, I would like to, here I would like to uh, focus on the, uh, the V360, uh, uh, 367F mutation. Um, which, uh, which uh, the result, the results published in the previous uh, publication indicates that it, it showed an increased binding affinity, which we also observed uh, in the ELISA format, and we contribute that um, increase of binding affinity towards the replacement of the valine side chain with the with the aromatic ring that could somehow stabilize the you know stabilize the region to make the um, to make this. Uh, interaction playing interaction playing more uh, exposed, and uh, there uh, and uh, of course there are reports indicating um, um, for the W four thirty six R mutant. Uh, the I think there were reported data indicating also exert some uh, increase in binding affinity, but here we only um, we we observed a slightly decrease the binding affinity uh, binding affinity towards ACE two. Uh, we and we, I think we contribute that to its um, uh, to its stability, which which is indicated by its monomer uh, content in, in, in the in the preparation. So the protein itself is somehow uh, maybe uh, more uh, more unstable and prone to aggregate. So that could somehow uh, 
affect the binding affinity towards the ACE2. And I think with the library of the RBD mutants and that the library is still expanding uh, at the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the time being, um, these mutants can be used for, you know, uh, to screening uh, either neutralize, neutralization antibodies or to help validate uh, serological assays to see if they're as, um, effect, uh, as effective against these mutants as against the, you know, the quote unquote wild type, which is, which is the published sequence. So here's just like a quick example. So we have discovered, uh, we have generated a neutralizing antibody. Um, which is the mouse monoclonal against the uh, against the RBD, and you can see as if we um, introduce this mutation into into the RBD region, uh, we do observe alteration in the in terms of a binding affinity. So the binding towards the wild the uh, the wild type is tighter, um, comparing to that of the mutant. So uh, in so this could be an indication that. Uh, some neutralizing antibody, the, the efficacy of some neutralizing antibodies or the sensitivity of some detecting antibodies could somehow be uh, compromised uh, with the presence of, you know, either one or a combination of a few mutants. So I think this mutant library is, so this is why we created this mutant library um, to help with, the, <clears throat> to help with, to ensure uh, the efficacy of the antibodies will be um, um, or or in an and in an effort to screen a like broad spectrum antibodies that can um, recognize uh, that can be as effective as the wild types and as the as the mutants. So um, yeah, I would like to uh, uh, quickly take a look at the you know the insect cells derived spike protein variants. So the um, we can use uh, we can the HEC two ninety three is uh, our uh, first go to choice because of its uh, relative uh, relatively fast speed in terms of uh, developing these proteins. But the insect cells are uh, also very um, useful tools um, in this uh, uh, in 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 this event. Uh, you can see they can produce the RBD and they can produce the S one as well and with very similar. Uh, but with you know small molecular weight variations due to the extent of their glycosylation, but uh, they uh, the proteins proteins produced in both systems can interact at similar binding affinity uh, towards ACE2, and insect cells are useful. So for instance, for the uh, for the S2 portion of the COVID2, we did have some difficulty to express this uh, this. Uh, Section using the uh, the HEC two ninety three in the beginning. So, uh, but the insect provide the insect cell line provided us with a very good alternative um, to produce to produce this protein. So then we can add this to our uh, uh, to our product collection. And here shows a uh, essentially optimization effort that we did to uh, stable to stabilize the this. Uh, the S2 portion of this protein, um, because it's like the trimer domain, so we're expecting it to form a you know trimeric form uh, trimeric format. But <clears throat> we would prefer um, you know we would uh, need to reduce the um, you know the the extent of aggregates. So we performed a uh, you know buffer optimization effort, and which uh, significantly inc uh, reduces reduced the um, extent of uh, aggregations. And this um, and the optimized uh, and the proteins in the optimized buffer showed a good um, stability and a recovery uh, after this uh, freeze and sawn ex uh, trial experiments, um, which indicates that uh, <clears throat> this buffer is uh, at this point ideal for the storage of the uh, of the S2 protein. And we can also. Uh, Make some engineering efforts to make proteins into um, into trimers, or to somehow enhance the trimerization process of the proteins. So, one of such uh, approach that we take is to add a photon to the to the C terminus of the of the fusion protein. So here we uh, <clears throat> here I showed an example. So we add a photon to a uh, to a wild type. 
uh, virus protein. And we also added, in the, in the same time, we altered several amino acids in the photon domain uh, to make it lose its ability for trimerization. And you can see a very obvious shift in terms of the retention time on the SEC column. And because, of course, the photon is associated with, you know, themselves with um, non-COVID interactions, they can be disrupted by um, uh, reagents such as SDS. So we treat this wild, uh, this protein with the wild type photon with SDS, and uh, you, uh, you can observe the somehow the association with the uh, with the trimers and the, uh, the peak migrates more towards uh, the retention time of the <clears throat> of the monomer essentially. So um, the 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 enhancement of this trimerization is actually quite useful in terms of uh, you know improving the binding affinity of and improving the st stability and the binding affinity of the uh, of the SARS um, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So here is an assay. Um, <clears throat> we construct a spike protein with a photon or without a photon, of course, and we, uh, we observed a 10 times increase in the, binding, uh, in the binding affinity towards ACE2, which indicates the, the trimerization and the st uh, stabilization of the uh, spike protein by photon is beneficial in terms of its, uh, um, in terms of its activity. So such efforts has been uh, used uh, to produce influenza HA proteins, RSV glycoproteins, and of course, as shown here, is a spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And we are also trying this um, uh, photon trimer uh, on other uh, virus proteins as well. And uh, <clears throat> so this is a, I think it's a very uh, interesting and a very practical method to enhance protein trimerization. And of course, last but not least, I would like to uh, give a shout out to the E. coli expression system, which allowed us to um, express uh, nuclear capsid protein. So during this optimization process, uh, we <clears throat> uh, optimize the temperature, the duration of the fermentation uh, to enhance the protein expression as soluble as you know as a soluble protein. And after purification and we do observe that the proteins are uh, the, the nuclear capsid proteins are present in a very stable oligomer, uh, oligomeric format, uh, which uh, can survive uh, like three times of freeze, freeze and sawn uh, cycles. And with and this uh, data actually agrees very well with the published record, it indicate the full length of the, the nuclear capsid should be presented in the format of a uh, a ligamer instead of a mon instead of a monomer, <clears throat> and we also um, in the preview uh, we also express the the nuclear capsid using uh, insect cell as insect system as well, and uh, <clears throat> and from the uh, and I think from the data you can see here that the protein expressed in E. coli shows a much better uh, profile in terms of its homogeneity. Uh, when comparing to the counterpart that is expressed in the, uh, in the insect cells. And of course, with a enhanced homogeneity, it also showed better, you know, binding affinity or specificity towards a um, nuclear capsid protein specific antibodies that we uh, generated. Now I would like to change the gear a little bit um, to talk about this beat map. Uh, high throughput recombinant antibody production platform that we have established in order to uh, you know, facilitate um, high screen, uh, high throughput antibody screenings, essentially. So basically what happens is that uh, we receive an antibody sequence library from a client, and then we gener uh, generate a primer library corresponding to each, um, you know, each construct using a high throughput primer design and synthesized platform. And then we convert these primers into construction vectors, and of course, then transiently transfect the HEC 293 cell culture array. And after the seven days of culture, we can um, uh, pur purify the antibody using one step purification, um, which usually results in uh, over 90% purity. And then we send the antibodies back to the client for validation and uh, 
they can pick up a few um, to uh, to scale up. So at this moment, uh, those the the cultural volume of this platform is set to be between twenty to four hundred mil, which will allows us to obtain quantity between uh, I would I believe microgram to to milligram scale, um, you know, at this high throughput stage. And this, the weekly capacity uh, is to produce 100 to 200 antibodies. And so far, we have um, completed, of course, like over 15 projects in this plat in this platform. And the over uh, and the uh, average success rate in terms of antibody expression is 85%. Um, <clears throat> so here is an example that uh, was a um, a collaborative work that we have done uh, in er uh, earlier. And the, the clients has uh, uh, collected B cells from the COVID-19 patient, and then they uh, synthesize, they generate this amber antibody sequence library, and we produced uh, 632 antibodies using the bitmap, and the, the antibodies were uh, validated by purity analysis and ELISA to bind for this as either the S1 or the, and both the S1 and the RBD of the of the COVID-2. Uh, <clears throat> and the clients identified 14 neutralizing antibodies and we helped them with the scale up to 10, between 10 to 300 mix. And they used the antibody to for animal studies as well as structural analysis. Uh, the results was published, I think in Cell in early April. Um, and here's the reference if you're interested. So um, basically to, uh, to sum up, so virus proteins, they're crucial starting materials for uh, drug discoveries and uh, test development. And we have created a comprehensive protein library uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 and other uh, coronaviruses. And I would like to also focus on the, the spike protein mutants um, so they can be, uh, they have been, a mutant library has been created and uh, the, um, the, we, all, we do observe some alteration in their uh, binding affinity towards, uh, towards the ACE2 a, uh, receptor. And last but not least, um, this high throughput bitmap platform can ensure uh, efficient generation of both recombinant proteins and antibodies. And I hope it will be uh, useful for um, your, uh, for your research, um, either in uh, SARS-CoV-2 or in other um, areas as well. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, thank all the uh, all the scientists and technicians that worked very hard to make this uh, to make these products available, and hopefully, um, <clears throat> with the help of these recombinant proteins and antibodies. Uh, we sure steer clear of this pandemic uh, sooner. And uh, I would like to conclude this presentation here. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the products and, uh, that we have developed, uh, please uh, follow the links on this page, or of course you can, you're more than welcome to contact us by email or phone. Um, so with that, thank you for your attention.